Thank you very much. Ooh. Oh, how things have changed. <laughs> how things have changed. I remember the first time I ever did a convention. Dark, cold winter day in Syracuse, New York. Small, poorly attended, very skeptical audience, still very loyal to Kirk and Bones and Spock. And I was waiting in the dealer's room, and they were selling those uh, action figures, the younger, thinner version of all of us. <laughs> they had a, uh, like a limited die lot data for 60 bucks, and old Baldy was selling for 65 bucks. The bar's there, and Tosh is here for 45 bucks. And, at the end of the table is a sign that says, buy any action figure, get Riker free. <laughs> Somewhat humbling. Yet true. So this is great. Thank you guys very much for coming. I've had a blast this weekend, and I'm overwhelmed that it's been 20 years since we all started. Um, I guess we should do this as a, as a Q&A. You guys don't have any questions, I'm sure. <laughs> Where do we start? Yes, sir. You've uh, directed quite a few episodes of Star Trek TNG and, and the rest. Uh, you did eight episodes, if I remember correctly, in uh, the new generation, or the next generation. Yeah, mm -hmm. And uh, one of my favorites was uh, The Offspring. Uh, how did you pick, did you get to pick which one you direct? Or oh, that's a good question. Um, directing on television is, is very much the luck of the draw. As you can imagine, with 26 episodes a year, they're not all going to be home runs, to use a, a, a baseball analogy. <laughs> what happened to the Blue Jays? <laughs> I knew them when they were contenders. What happened to this team? Wow, no pitching is right. And Vernon can't, can't handle the whole team on his shoulders. At any rate, you are um, you're you're really the at the whim of of how good the script is. The one that I got had two things going for it. First of all, it starred Brent. So it, a good data episode is hard to beat. And uh, it was the first time that Rene Echeverria had written the script. And it was submitted by him. So I, and I also was, had been dying to do an episode, so I'd been sort of prepping for three years. So I was painfully over-prepared. <laughs> and then glad that Rick Berman finally relented and gave me one to do. But to answer your question, you don't have any input into what episode you get. You get the luck of the draw. You get assigned at the beginning of the season. You can do episode four, and you can do seven, and you can do 18. And whatever those scripts happen to be, you make the best of it, you know. And some of them were stinkers, and some of them were, some of them were. I thought when I got the episode um, Cause and Effect, which has the same story told repeatedly, I thought it was a joke from Brad and Brogan. Now wait a minute, That's, you, you guys didn't write anything? It's the same act over and over again. Where's act two? Where's act two? No, 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 this is the story. I said, come on, it's not, you're not really going to make me do this. It was like a directing exercise. It was like a game. Ha! Foiled again. Does that answer your question? Well, your favorite. My favorite besides Offspring, which I have to. The very fondest, keen fondest of. I think the best stuff we did was that uh, two-parter, uh, Best of Both Worlds. And the worst, and most embarrassing, and one that Gene would even have been embarrassed by, was that horrible racist episode of the first season. Code of Honor. Oh my God in heaven. That's what Denise, who made the greatest career choice of all time, was still on the show. What was she thinking? <laughs> she went to Roddenberry allegedly and said, you know, you have to write more for my character or you have to write me off the show. And Gene said, well, I've got seven other characters to write for, so if you're really serious, I, you know, I will I'll, I'll write Tasha off the show. And, you know, of course she <laughs> had two fabulous episodes which we got rid of her in, and she had all these wonderful things to do, and I think, I would imagine, regrets her decision. But I, I Remember the episode where she died? Was that the one where I was in the black goo? Yeah. <laughs> no, that was Metamucil. <laughs> Metamucil and black printer's ink. And they said, oh, come on, come on, Frank. Go ahead, just, it'll be, it'll be fine. Just get in there. 
it'll be fine. Uh, it was poor Will Toms, one of the special effects guys, was already in there. His skin had already turned this horrible gray color. So I got in, I spent the day in this black muck, and they finally finished, and I got in the back of a pickup truck, and they took me to the uh, industrial end of the lot where they hosed me down. And... I did. How's it going? Do you miss me? I'll be up there soon. So I was stuck, and they watered me down, and they hosed me down, and then I get back, and I'm just about to get cleaned up, and they say, bring Frakes back in, put together in the shit, so I get back in the bucket. <laughs> anyway, in that episode, do you remember the, the holodeck doors open, those rolling green hills? We were all, frankly, sad that Denise was leaving, because we had become a family, and we cared about her, and the, so the, the characters were sad, and the actors and the people were sad, and it was kind of a, it wasn't the happiest day of our lives, and Patrick, God bless him, lightened the load for all of us because as the doors opened on that holiday room, that big rolling room thing, he, he strolled out and sang, The Hills! <laughs> Old Baldy. <laughs> Captain Pecan, the wackiest nut in the galaxy. That's a very nice ensemble, by the way. I know. Is that the Picard? Wait, did you just do the Picard? <laughs> you have to, don't you? Is it necessary? Do you walk like this? <laughs> do they spray the back of your head too? <laughs> Go ahead. Is there any type of uh, directing role that you've been offered that you just went uh, interesting, but uh, no? <laughs> like, uh, well, I don't want to say it's one of those, but... Nobody that ever, ever offered me any porn. <laughs> you know what they say, I don't know much about pornography, but I know what I like. <laughs> I always like that line, I'm not sure I'm quite... Why? It's all yours, it's all yours, this is all yours to steal, all this stuff. Have no fear. Surely you're not videotaping in the back, because, well, you'll have to be beheaded. Alright. Did I, like, bone you and totally ignore your question? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much what happened there, didn't it? I walked away. I'm sure it has. I see what you're wearing. I know how you get treated like you're the commander. No, no, no. I, I, uh, I tried for a long time to only do shows that my kids would watch, but I've, I've given that premise up now too. I did this thing that was on last night that was so incredibly dark. This thing called um, uh, the Discarded, which was written by Harlan Ellison, who's a classic Star Trek writer, and written by Josh Olson, who wrote History of Violence. And, Star Brian Dennehy and John Hurt and James Denton, the guy from Desperate Housewives. It's about a, a spaceship full of, of mutants, one of whom is played by Harlan Ellison with a cow's udder growing out of his neck. And John Hurt has a second head growing out of his shoulder. And it's really dark and really depressing. So tune in. <laughs> and gather the kids. <laughs> yes. Of the show, how many times did you and the cast drive directors to distraction Oh, God. He asks the question. We were, as you probably heard, not the most disciplined cast. <laughs> I think part of it was because the work that we did was so serious, we always seemed so serious. Alert! Skills up and arm the assholes on torpedoes and all that shit, you know? <laughs> but we were always serious. Everything was serious. No levity. So between takes, it was madness, so especially on the bridge, because Brent was insane. <laughs> He'd sing and dance, and Dorn used to dive over the top of the thing and tackle Patrick and <laughs> threaten to crash an egg on the top of his bald head. It was really, it was, it was chaos. It was really chaos, and directors who didn't know us were driven, driven to insanity. One guy walked off the set, he left. 
He went to Rick Burns and said, they won't listen to me. <laughs> I finally learned, I, I finally learned that the only way to get everybody to shut up was to yell action. So I just, because rehearsals were, nobody rehearsed. Nobody would, it was just, it was madness. It was impossible to be a director on that show. And I found out the hard way. But it was, um, if you called action, all of a sudden, everybody did, did their job. So I just, screw rehearsal, we'll just, we'll just shoot until you people shut up. <laughs> That's the approach you had to take. But we were shameless. It was, and nothing was sacred, so everybody abused everybody else verbally, constantly. And so if you had any thin skin, or if you came in tired and moody, that didn't go down very well. <laughs> it was a very silly place to work. And Patrick, we had to, you know, Americanize, because he, he, was, he was a serious actor. Well, Shakespeare. I remember him sitting in the uh, the middle of the the bridge and getting bombarded by uh, some alien fire on the ship, and we all pretending to shake. Marina's, what is that, Marina? She's over here with her hair perfect, <laughs> shaking around, making sure she looked good. And I'd be over here on the other side, throwing myself around the ring. And old Patrick in his uh, ergometrically designed chair. Hold it on. <laughs> and I hear this little voice, not little voice, his big voice, as he's rumbling around pretending to be hit by phasers. Oh, Jonathan. Jonathan. 25 years of the Royal Shakespeare. <laughs> We like the up. Yes, sir. Do you find it difficult to uh, act in the shows that you are directing? I find it difficult to uh, direct in a spacesuit. <laughs> There's no place to put your notes. There's no pockets. Where are the pockets in those things? And how do you get a cup of coffee on this enterprise? Where do you go to the bathroom? All those things. All those things. It was a little more uh, tedious. My wife always thought that I was good in the shows that I directed because I was so exhausted that my acting was more relaxed. <laughs> I think she may, have been, she may have been right. It was easier, I thought, to not act in the shows that I was uh, directing, but it was inevitable in that show on certain nights. Yes? Um, uh, um, in the episode, Second Chances, um, did you find it difficult acting with yourself? <laughs> Just a minute. What do you think? I thought it was fine. I was the where we introduced Thomas Riker, Lavar's directing debut. This is a true story. Marina, who we all adore, right? Marina Surtees says to me in the middle of that episode, you know what? I think Thomas Riker is cuter. <laughs> Did, have you ever seen Marina? Yes. You know, she had this dog. It wasn't really a dog, it was a rat. <laughs> it was called Skilagi. Skilagi, oh, I love him, never Skilagi. Horrible little rodent type of dog. And the one day it rained in LA, she used to bring Skilagi to work in a little bag, like a little movie star. She had Skilagi in a little bag. <laughs> So it's raining, and she's bringing this little wet rat into the makeup room. And Michael Dorn and I, big gentleman, said, Marina, go ahead. Get your uh, wig put on or whatever the hell it is you do. We'll take care of Skilagi. We'll dry him off. So we took the little Skilagi. Put him in the microwave. Put him around the microwave. Put dry him off. Then we took him out, and we dropped him. Bam! Right out of the trailer. That's not true. None of that's true. Who's Kilagi? Marina. Skilagi's dead. Isn't Skilagi dead? I could call. Would this be a good time? Yeah, Mina, hi, Jonathan. Is Skilagi dead? I'm out. I'm just telling people in Toronto. Yeah, I'm sorry to bring it up. Yeah, Skilagi is dead. 
Yes, sir. <laughs> so you had your hand up for her. Is that where this is going? You don't really have a question. Will the writers wrote Will Riker in a different way than you interpreted Will Riker? Yes. One of the things that I thought was absurd about the writing of Riker was, you probably remember this, he always, in the beginning of the first few years of the series, he always said, I want to have my own ship. I, all I want to be is a captain of my own, you know, all this. Then they offer Riker the ship, and he goes, oh, I'm not ready to go. I want to stay here in the Enterprise with you guys. You look like a schmuck. So I made the mistake of mentioning this to the late, great Michael Pillar one time, and then all those ships that Riker had been offered were the ones that blew up at Best of Both Worlds. <laughs> there goes the Titan. <laughs> so, in the back. Uh, I gotta ask you this question. Uh, being a William Riker now, Hearts, uh, as an actor, is it a curse being a Trekkie or is it a blessing? How would you describe it? Is it a curse being a Trekkie? Yeah, be, being uh, uh, is a William Riker. Is it, is it, is it a, a curse to be part of the uh, greatest franchise in the history of television? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm very thankful that I learned to direct because I wouldn't want to be trying to make a living as a, you know, 50-something actor who was really, oh, you're the guy from Star Trek. There is a lot of that. But I think Leonard Nimoy said, it's better to be typecast than not be cast at all. <laughs> so that's the uh, philosophy that I've adopted. Yes? Um, your involvement with Roswell is for the Do you have any idea of your show? Roswell was a wonderful show. I thought very proud of it. I was going to direct the pilot of Roswell, but I was hired to produce it and direct it, and I was somebody at Fox thought, well, maybe he shouldn't direct the pilot because he's actually finishing Insurrection at the time. So uh, David Nutter did a wonderful job of that. And we take great pride in having discovered um, Catherine Heigl, who's now the star of Grey's Anatomy. I thought Roswell had a great cast. Wonderful Canadian actor, Brendan Fair, was in that show. And the sweetest kid was um, Tom Hanks' son, Colin Hanks, who was also in the show. Roswell was filled with... Uh, uh, what I thought were some problems in that there were the, the secret on Roswell that these guys, these gorgeous kids happened to be aliens <laughs> wasn't much of a secret because it seems that everybody in the town knew. <laughs> so I never really got how that was worked out. But it did have Bill Sadler on the show, who I thought was a genius who played the, the sheriff. It was, it was a very interesting, it had an interesting life, that show, because I think it was on three different networks in the first season. That was two different networks. And then we were able to convince the wonderful writer Ron Moore to come over and help with our mythology, as he was so um, adept at creating all the Klingon mythology on our show. So I have very, very fond memories of that show and that cast and that whole experience. I wish, I wish, I wish we'd made a Roswell movie, because that, that show never really ended. That show never really had any uh, closure. <laughs> yes, that's very orange. <laughs> In Star Trek. Yeah. Next oh, well, I love that show. Next Generation. <laughs> That's actually my favorite of the Star Treks. Much better than Deep Throat Nine, Deep Space Nine. <laughs> Which is a perfectly good show. And Voyager, Star Trek Light. And whatever that show was that Marina and I did there at the end. With Scott Bakula. Enterprise. Do we take enough shots, everybody? <laughs> and then when they combined the two casts in that wonderful movie, Generations, which is a story about two captains in search of one good hairpiece. <laughs> Just hang on. <laughs> Let me tell you about the beard. Let me tell you briefly about it. First of all, it used to be black, do you remember? <laughs> 20 years ago, that show started. After the first season of Star Trek Next Generation, there was a writer's strike, I think. And during the writer's strike, those of us who hated to shave grew beards. And we went back after the strike was settled, and I had a meeting with um, Gene and Rick 
Patrick and Brent and I, and at the meeting, uh, Gene Roddenberry, the wonderful Gene Roddenberry, said, Franks, I like the beard. It looks nautical. <laughs> but what he decided was that Riker should have not the beard. He would keep the beard because it looked nautical. But then he took it one step too far. He said, it'll not only be nautical, it'll be decorative. <laughs> So I had, now I had a nautical, decorative beard. But at the point he saw it, it wasn't decorative enough. So they took me to Mike Westmore, the king of makeup. And we sat, they sat me down in this barber chair and they gave Gene and Berman and Mike Westmore um, eyeliner pencils. And they drew on my face the shape they thought the nautical, decorative beard should be. <laughs> so then they shaved it down and they put it on, and then we had to put it on camera and they had decisions and then they decided they'd take it too much off. So they glued hair back on my face. <laughs> And all this went on until they finally got that shape that was very sort of Rikerian and very decorative, I might add. And about three or four months later, we got the only note we ever got from the studio, which was, we need to reduce Riker's beard by about 30% of the lower left side. <laughs> That's the note from the studio on the Star Trek? <laughs> so that's why I had a beard, because it was nautical. And decorative. Yes? After Next Generation, you went on to Gargoyles. Marie went on to Gargoyles. And I think Kate went on to Gargoyles. Dorn went on to Gargoyles. Brent went on to Gargoyles. Uh, what was it like taking people you already had worked with into a different show and a different type of environment? Gargoyles was the greatest job in the world. <laughs> you could go to work in your pajamas. You could, you could go to work in your pajamas. You sat in a chair. The script was in front of you, you never had to learn your lines. You sat in a room, you acted with your friends. If it didn't go right, the guy in the booth said, let's do it again. You did like four shows at a sitting. They brought free lunch. <laughs> that is the way to make a living. Bring gargoyles back, gargoyles and beyond belief. Another great job. You put on a black suit, you walk from A to B, can you walk from A to B? I said, yeah, I'm sure I could. I could go from here to here. I said, and could you say these lines while you're doing it? I said, I think I could. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Jonathan Franks. The footage you're about to see is extremely graphic. <laughs> no, it was, I mean, those are the gigs. Well, where are those jobs? Yes, sir. Uh, do you have to keep any memorabilia from any show you did? I have Marina's Star Trek bra. <laughs> off with one hand. <laughs> Certain people appreciate that, huh? No, I have one space suit and I have a phaser. And I have a tricorder. And the captain's chair. And all of 10 forward. <laughs> we weren't allowed to take anything off the show. Yes, sir. Um, I, I've seen in the past that there, there were some of the other actors that you've worked with uh, on Star Trek who were sort of concerned as to the direction of Star Trek during, especially during Enterprise, and sort of what was your take on what was going on? Because uh, I know any and a lot of the fans of the people here would agree that there were things going on that people didn't like, and just how did you feel about that? Oh, you want a serious answer, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, it wasn't that funny. I thought, frankly, that the um, that Paramount, in its infinite wisdom and greed, went to the well one too many times in too short a period of time. That's what I think happened. And uh, speaking of Enterprise. It was a very awkward, you know how Marina and I were called in to do the last episode. And Scott Bakula, who I think is a wonderful guy, and a wonderful actor, and a great captain, I felt very strange, so I went up to him and I said, Scott, I know that if this were my show, I would feel pissed off, or put out, or indignant that someone from another show was brought in, first of all, this, this show was canceled prematurely, and, and someone was brought in to do the last episode, and everybody's in mourning and all stuff, so, and he said, I'm fine with it. 
welcome. He was, he was such a mensch and such a gentleman about the entire experience. I was uh, doubly impressed. But it, it was a little, it was a very uncomfortable way to take it out. It was great to be with Marina again, obviously. It was great to see that we could still get into our spacesuit. <laughs> but I thought it was a very thin line to the defiant and a very even thinner line to the Enterprise and not, not the kind of power. I mean, I know it was, Rick's intention was that it would be a, um, a valentine to the, to the fans, which I think the intentions were good. I'm not sure the execution was as, as no. you know what I mean? It was, it was uh, awkward. Always good to have a job, but it was awkward. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> John Delancey is a genius, first of all. And I always thought, I don't know how you feel, I always thought that one of the movies should have had a cue. Yeah. 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 Is that me? Did I spit that in my outside voice? Wow. What a way to go out. I think Delancey is so gifted and so... He's like Brent. He's always clever. He's quick. He's, he's magical. He's, he's, he's perfect for the part, obviously. And um, he was like our litmus test, because he used to come through every a couple times a year, or at least once a year, so I always... We could always go to him and see him. He's a great person to judge how the, the series went because he wasn't with us every day in the trenches, but he was a member of the family because he'd been on the pilot. I'm a huge fan. I'm actually going to see him, I think. He's in Atlanta with us. We're doing the, uh, what's that called, Dragon Con? So I'll be down there with, with um, Brent and Gates and Delancey, and I'm looking forward to a big steak dinner <laughs> and catch up with Delancey. He's also a, he's a fascinating guy who was... Uh, I think his father was a conductor or an oboe player with the Philadelphia Orchestra, so he was raised in an interesting environment. He's, a, he's, a, he's one of my faves. And the other guy out here, Dwight Schultz, another favorite of our, <laughs> of our And Delancey, like Marina and other actors, is sorely underused, I think. I think it's uh, people of that talent should be working more. Yes? Um, in your early days as a director, and, and when you first get, first of all, I was just wondering who are your influences, and how did you like, take up the craft of directing? I was told when I was in acting school, steal from the best. <laughs> <laughs> so I stole from Spielberg. <laughs> I loved to watch the way he moved the camera. I was a big Scorsese fan, a big Robert Altman fan. And um, but for Star Trek, the uh, Spielberg. The, the just off-centered close-ups and, and the crawls and all that stuff that uh, the pushes, all that stuff is stolen directly from uh, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> Proud of it. <laughs> in, the, in the back. Um, if you could have one uh, piece of technology from Star Trek, what would it be and why? That's a good question. One piece of technology from Star Trek, what would it be and why? I suppose the holodeck wouldn't be a bad yeah. one. <laughs> And a trip to Risa. <laughs> no, I think flying as much as I do, it would be great to be able to beam somewhere, to be honest. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did have someone ask me, in all seriousness, at one of these, Mr. Franks, what does it feel like when you beam somewhere? <laughs> and they were serious. So I had to tell them, naturally. Mr. Franks, what does it feel like? I don't know. It would be great to be able to beam in and beam out. Let me see if I can do it. Oh, I'll do one impersonation. I do a very limited number of impersonations. See if you know what this is. <laughs> the the Android, am I right? In my 30 years, in the theater, I've been treated like this. <laughs> nice planet. <laughs> yes? Uh, can you describe the first time you met Gene Roddenberry, what that was like, and your favorite Gene Roddenberry story? I'd be happy to. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. <laughs> Roddenberry, the late, great, magical man, took me under his wing because when I was auditioning for Riker, it was a... Uh, I auditioned like six, seven times over this long six-week period because a different level of uh, 
administration people at Paramount that needed to be convinced that I could play the part and all this crap. And it was just, it was an ongoing process, much more harder than to get the job than it ever was to do the job. And the last few auditions, I was called into Gene's office before, and I worked with Gene and with Corey Allen, who was the director of the pilot. And I remember one time, Roddenberry, who I believe saw himself a little bit in Wesley and a lot in Riker and a little bit in Picard. I think that that was sort of where Gene, that was, uh, that was Gene. That was where he wrote his vision, was across those three characters, I, I, I believe. And he said to me, and he was serious, and, it, and I took it to heart. He was trying to get me into the, uh, sort of the frame of mind, do the audition well, and to, to be in the place that he wanted Riker to be. And he said, Jonathan, in the 24th century, and he believed this, and I think we would be so lucky just to, to land there. In the 24th century, there will be no hunger, and there will be no greed, and all their children will know how to read. And I thought that was, that's my favorite James Roddenberry story. He was a great man. I was very lucky to work with him, and very irreverent, and very funny, <laughs> and the biggest hands of any living human. <laughs> yes, sir. Must we? <laughs> Just kidding. May we? Oh, Gargoyles. I never saw any of the episodes. I just remember making them. Um, I think Gargoyles was canceled prematurely, unlike Star Trek, which they went to the well too often for. I don't know what happened to Gargoyles and why it was taken off. It certainly couldn't have been the piddling money they paid us. So, <laughs> Yes? Are there other uh, guest appearances that stand out, like Major Barrett? Uh, that you know who I was? Well, it was always great to have Major on the show because she was family anyway. I mean, because all the all the Christmas parties were always at her fabulous house in Bel Air, and so she was literally family. But you know, you remind me of is um, God, I loved her, Ensign Rowe, um, Michelle Forbes. I had such a crush on her. What a wonderful actress. She was great on the show. It was always great when Whoopi was on the show. Who has the foulest mouth of anything? <laughs> So that was always a blast. Oh, you know who else I adored, who was a big Trekkie and asked to be on the show was um, Gene Simmons, who was in the, what was the episode of the, uh, God, I directed it. It was the courtroom episode, it was called, Drumhead, God, you're here. Yes. As a producer and a director, I think the most important part of my job is to hire the right people to do their jobs. And that's um, something I've been pretty lucky with. And then trust them to do it. If you hire the right DP and you let them light the show properly, you talk about how to make the shots, and you don't mess with that department, that's one you know, less headache. If you hire the right costume designer and you have meetings, you talk about what the people look like, to let them do their job. You look great if you hire the right people and then let them do it. I think it's, uh, that's why being a director is the greatest job in the world. I think. What do you think? <laughs> I'll be out of here soon. You can take a picture of someone else. Go ahead. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> you know what? Why didn't I direct Nemesis? Nobody asked me to direct Nemesis. <laughs> I was available. <laughs> you know what I think? I know you didn't ask, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> oh, now you want to take a picture? <laughs> Digital or film? <laughs> Nemesis, I thought, had too much of the wonderful Thomas Hardy and not enough of the original cast. I think that was the, uh, the first problem. And we shot all that great stuff at the wedding, including Brent singing and me playing the trombone and all stuff with Wesley and Whoopi. And that was all cut out. Let me get that for you. <laughs> but it was, um, oh, it wasn't our finest hour, I don't think. But it was a little over an hour. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, I will tell you this about the future of Star Trek. 
I personally am very optimistic about what's going on now. I think J.J. Abrams, who does Lost, and who's in whose hands the next Star Trek movie is. Unfortunately. <laughs> Not that I'm bitter. Seriously, I think J.J. Abrams, I love Lost. I think he's a great storyteller. And everything I've heard is that he's, he's contacted Bill and Leonard, and I love this kid from Heroes, uh, Quinto, who's playing Spock. I think that's great. I gather that Abrams has a real uh, deep respect for Roddenberry's vision of the, sh of the original Star Trek and the Prime Directive. So I think, I think we're in good hands. I mean, time will tell, but I certainly think that if it's not us, it's certainly someone who does care about the franchise and care about the characters, and I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that it's, uh, aren't we all? <laughs> I mean, you don't want to go out with Nemesis as the last movie. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, we saw uh, Reed Sages a few months ago, and he said that on Dark Road, he misrepresented that you were bringing sidekick and you were the main character. I misrepresented something about Marina? No, no, no. Marina was the lead in Gargoyles. Just ask her. She was the lead on Star Trek. She had the most hair and the biggest boobs. Well, next to Warp. <laughs> now, I had an idea. Tell me what you think of this idea. Half hour sitcom. The Rikers in space. <laughs> their wacky Uncle Data and their little dog Warp. <laughs> On the Titan, right? We're married now. I happen to think it's a smashing idea. Yes. From the show? Um, I must say that for my first venture into motion pictures, I was given a gift with uh, Brennan and Ron's first contact. I thought, it's like it, it's what we talked about earlier about Offspring. That script was so strong and stood on its own without having to be, I think it stood on its own as a movie without. You didn't have to know anything about Star Trek, is what I'm trying to say. It was a movie that was, it was a horror movie, it had comedy in it, it had drama, it had action, it had pathos, it was funny, it, well, it, was, it had it all. And it was big, and it was well cast, I was lucky to get Alfrey and Cromwell and stuff, so that will always be a, a favorite. <coughs> um, the second question is a good one. I don't know, I'll think about it, I don't have an answer for that one. That doesn't happen often. <laughs> Someone who talks. Speaking of Titan, uh, hey, speaking of Titan, am I talking to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Speaking of Titan, have you read the uh, uh, the pocket novels? I, I can't read, again. so <laughs> I've, I've heard they're very good. Yeah. The only ones I've read is Zimzadi, <laughs> which took about three months to read on tape. I had to do all those silly accents. I feel great pain from both of them. Uh, yeah, when you first got into that TNG, had you like watched the original Star Trek or were you at all a fan of it? I was not as familiar with the original Star Trek as people like Dorn and, and uh, Will Wheaton were, but I, I went to the video store and boned up on my uh, Star Trek. I didn't have any idea that it was such a part of the popular culture. But it reminds me of two things that I will share with you. One is my beautiful and talented wife, Jeannie Francis, who plays Laura. When she grew up, she used to have a poster, not only of uh, David Cassidy, but of <laughs> Captain Kirk on her wall. And right after the show started, I went home to see my mom and dad in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where I live. And biggest life on the refrigerator door is a picture of Kirk. Patrick Stewart. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the message is there, or the connection, but it's true stories. We never pulled any pranks at all in our son. You know what it was? It was work. Work, work, work. Very serious work. Really? In the back. That's probably Marina. Don't talk about Skilogi like that! Sometimes it's very painful. <laughs> Go 
Go ahead. The episode of uh, Lois and Clark that you did with your wife. Oh yeah, Lois and Clark. I, I really enjoyed Are you Canadian? the episode. <laughs> yes, I am. Oh. <laughs> of course. I'm here. <laughs> um, you get Lois and Clark. Do you see it? Yeah. I just wondered if uh, how it was to work with your wife, and if you'd like to do anything in the future. With it was great to work with my wife. Thank you. And uh, we got to go to work in one car. <laughs> we had a little J-Mo by that time. He was a little baby. He loved walking around the uh, Daily Planet. We got to play those crazy characters who were sort of like Donald Trump and Obama. So we thought, now that our kids are more grown up, we'd show them the episode. So we ordered it from Amazon, and I got it sent to the house and put it on. The kids said, God, Mom, you look so weird. Look at your hair. You're not even funny, Dad. These guys could have cared less. We were so excited. Look, Mom and Dad are in this show together. Nobody cared. This is, of course, the same kid. He used to have a bucket in the playroom when he was a little baby, and in it were all these free action figures that we got from the show. So he'd pick one up, and it was uh, Worf. He'd say, oh, look, Daddy, it's Michael. And look, he'd pick Patrick up. He'd say, oh, look, it's Patrick. And he'd say, there's Daddy, and he drowned Daddy in his bucket. <laughs> but in this bucket of, of toys was uh, Gumby. You know who Gumby is? Yeah. Gumby. He picked Gumby up. He said, "Dad, do you work with him too?" <laughs> True story. <laughs> Only the truth here. Well, except about the microwave. <laughs> it was 30 seconds we put it on. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're featured in the Deep Space Nine episode Defiant. I'm what sorry, I, I, I missed it. Okay, you were featured in the Deep Space Nine episode Defiant. What was it like working with the Deep Space Nine cast? And do you ever wish you would reprise your role as uh, Thomas Riker to finish off his character and see what happens with him? I thought they were like a jit out of Deep Space Nine. I thought they should have brought Thomas Riker back and the Nas sends him off to prison somewhere. Isn't that what happened? I went to some Cardassian prison. I like Deep Space. I was a, a big Avery fan. I love Colm. Terry's hysterical. I always like working, I love working over there as a director. As a matter of fact, somebody yesterday asked me to, uh, to mention Deep, Throat, Deep Space Nine. And, uh, it was a darker show, obviously. I would have made it a lot darker. I thought it was a great show. And uh, the cast was, was fantastic. I will tell you all that I have been uh, told to wrap it up. I want to thank you all. I've had a blast here, and I had no idea that the fans were still this strong. God bless you all. Good